Good morning, Chameleon Academy. This is Bill Strand, and I am here with Josh Halter of The Bio Dude. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bill, uh, and the rest of the Chameleon Pod, uh, Academy podcast. Thank you for hosting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, Josh, we are diving into the bioactive arts here on the podcast, and the, the whole center of bioactive is the substrate but i gotta tell you you're looking at this substrate i'm looking at these ingredients it it sounds like a lot of stuff i mean tree fern fiber sphagnum moss uh what the heck Let, let's just start off with and help us understand what's going on there I got you. Uh, first what is the purpose of the substrate in a bioactive system so, great question. The purpose of the the substrate um, is a, a substrate is essentially a compound mixture of selected ingredients, as simple or extensive as you want them to be, uh, to interact well with your environment, to foster, uh, you know, different types of symbiotic relationships with, you know, with your fungus, your funguses, your bacteria, and of course your different types of cleanup crew, whether it's earwigs springtails or isopods now when it comes to you know all of the different ins and outs of substrate and how it works in a bioactive environment chameleon specifically essentially it is the catalyst to help set your specific husbandry parameters while giving you the necessary tools when it comes to your ingredient list to be able to provide your living plants, such as, you know, your Shuffleera trees, your ficus trees, or if you're using maidenhair ferns or fofos, or, you know, any, you know, any vining covering plant to make that environment be dense, chameleons like. Essentially, it helps foster proper development of those root systems, um, as well as it maintains itself in a, in a healthy way. So when you look at planet Earth, you know depending on what part let's focus let's focus on you know the the north american continent whether you are here in texas you know you go into texas and you dig down into the dirt you know you're going to find a lot of mineral content with clay and, and other types of aggregate material granite things like that whereas we go up into the northeast a little bit into you know pennsylvania where i'm from there's limestone in the soil uh the soil is a lot finer than what it comes to because that's the type of life that that soil sustains and the mineral content within that soil is meant for the environment in which we're replicating so essentially to answer your question is when you're dealing with substrate or you can call it dirt or you can call it media really what or or stratum you know there's a lot of different you know names for it but essentially at the end of the day what it comes down to is you are creating a base layer in your living ecosystem that fosters and maintains a healthy balance of everything that you need to happen within that enclosure to maintain a self-maintaining, you know, a self-regulating ecosystem in your tank. Because, put it simple, chameleons and other reptiles are wild animals. They're not domesticated by any means. And when we keep wild animals as pets, it is important that we try to recreate their wild habitat as naturally as possible for you know intrinsic and for enrichment purposes and the soil plays a significant role with that uh, i like to think of the substrate when it comes to your terrarium as the backbone of your tank um, because it is the vertebrae that keeps the that keeps the fluid and the spinal cord within everything to function throughout the point a to point b and that's pretty much how I always figured figured it out uh, when it comes to like how I was learning and things like that. All right, what are important characteristics of this substrate to work as a bioactive? Yes, so when you think of just substrate, you know, or stratum or whatever, um, the biggest thing that, you know, you wanna be sure of is its functionality for the type of environment that you are replicating. So here's an example. Let's say you are attempting to create a 
um, a desert habitat, okay? Easy, simple. However, if you're creating a desert habitat, you don't necessarily want to use, you know, cocoa choir. Cocoa choir is extremely hydro, uh, hydroscopic, which means it absorbs as much water as it can. And when it absorbs all of that water, water just sits there. So while it's putting out more moisture into the air, there's more moisture than depending on what other ingredients you're using that are just sitting in the soil. And what that can do then is mess with your parameters when it comes to, you know, basic husbandry. So when we are looking at A, B, C with what's important with functionality for substrate, one, like I said, is the ingredients, are they going to function well for the bio that I'm replicating? Number two, does this soil harbor, is it capable of harboring life? Meaning that is there a surface area within this soil that is going to become a microbial hotspot for your, for your different bacteria, such as archaea bacteria, for your funguses, such as mycorrhizae fungus, you have your endo and ecto. And then as well as taking moisture into those portions that will attract various cleanup crews, such as isopods, springtails, mealworms, earwigs, roaches, whatever you want to use. Okay. And then number three is, is how well does it aerate from point A to point B? So if you, so all of us know that the only really spots on earth where you step into dead, dead dirt, dead matter is really in swamps or burnt or areas where forests had controlled or non-controlled burns. Whereas that soil ends up becoming extremely, extremely rich and healthy after the fact. But when you're looking at like a bog, so when you are walking through a bog and you step down and all of a sudden the smell of rotten eggs hits you in the face. What you're smelling is methane, and methane is a byproduct of anaerobic, ba uh, sorry, of anaerobic bacteria, which is bacteria that does not need oxygen to survive. And what that bacteria is doing in conjunction with decaying matter, it, it is depleting the oxygen level in the soil, which is creating a stagnant, nasty environment that almost nothing can survive in when it comes to most animals or living organisms unless they specialized to live in that type of thing now how that relates to your soil is methane is extremely toxic it can kill you in an enclosed environment so when you are looking at a, at a habitat that you are creating for your pet reptile you want to make sure that your soil is capable of having airflow from the very top of the enclosure the very bottom because if your soil is compacted and so tight and that air can only get down to here instead of all the way down to here this little bottom layer here is going to become oxygen deprived and then when it becomes oxygen deprived that's when you get that bacteria similar to a fish tank you know um, when you don't change the water and you just let your nasty ammonia and things if the nitrogen cycle isn't completely you know cycle through you know you get those negative side effects and it's no different than soil so you want to make sure that it can aerate and a really good way to be able to understand if the soil can aerate or not is understanding you know that the ingredients that you are using to create your bioactive soil or whether it, it or if you're going and purchasing it from a commercial vendor that they're using ingredients that are designed to function with a b and c that i just told you so in short you want to make sure it's it, you want to make sure that it can it can harbor your your symbiotic relationships two you want to make sure that it drains effectively and three you want to make sure that you know with everything and all the ingredients you know that you're using that it's going to give you the proper proper parameters in your cage and number four which this is very specific so it may not apply to you so if you're keeping dark frogs this is going to apply to you but if you're keeping a corn snake or if you're you know keeping an animal that needs to dig down 18 inches to lay their eggs this might be beneficial for you and that is that the soil can retain all of its tunnels and burrows without collapsing now reptiles you know you know 
learn when it comes to husbandry parameters, shedding, respiration, and hydration are some of the three most important parameters for me. At least with my years of keeping, that's that's something I've always had be the backbone of my standard of care. And when you are able to have a good quality substrate that retains all those tunnels and burrows, it gives you different micro different microclimates. Different microclimates gives you different opportunities. It gives them shelter. It gives them the ability uh, to get a little bit of in intrinsic and enrichment out of the, in my opinion, one of the most important sections of your terrarium, which is which is the substrate. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So one thing we have heard about is the ABG mixes at Atlanta Botanical yeah, Garden. That's right. Why has that become the standard for? these uh, bioactive mixes that, that's a great question bill so it is definitely a standard for your very high humidity biomes um you know so the Atlanta Atlanta botanical gardens mix that has been around for i think 40 50 60 years it's been around for an extremely long time and it is a proven it was a proven method to grow different epiphytes orchids um, and then the dart for all community in the 80s took it and started keeping, you know, some of the first import imported dart frogs on it, if I'm not mistaken, and salamanders. And, and they saw that it works out well because of its draining capabilities. Now, ABG works so well with these high humidity biomes because the ingredients are very clunky. So, um, again, I, 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 with my mixes, I created my own it's nothing like abg i'm gonna be honest with you okay. because i don't like how chunky it is and to me like i've seen animals eat the big chunks and i just i don't it's not for me but that doesn't mean just because it's not for me it isn't for other people because it is a great great product to use but like when you're using ingredients charcoal orchid bark cocoa fiber spag moss dust and tree fern fiber i can tell you wholeheartedly right now most of the horticultural grade charcoal is becoming so unsustainable that we're now having to get it out of South America and from bamboo charcoal. Tree fern fiber is so hard to get right now because there's only one or two families in Guatemala that own it all. And they have a complete grip hold on the market. Um, and then the major importer of it, which was Acadian Supply, which is a great company. You can also get your sphagnum moss from them. Uh, you know, it came in with like this weird fungus on it that was impacting the growth of springtails and isopods um, in the actual enclosure. Don't know how much that affects me, but I never use it, so I don't know. Um, and then, of course, like I said, the sphagnum moss dust, that's a great product. It's just, it's very hard to get. Um, and then your cocoa choir. So a lot of you see cocoa choir all the time. You know, Exoterra plantation soil, Zoomed Ecoworth. You know, that is straight coconut fiber that is put into a bin and then it gets sal it gets desalinized. Uh, so that way all the all the nasties are taken out of it because if you don't desalinize it and you use it on amphibians, the soil will suck out all the mineral content of the amphibian and just straight kill it. That. Um, so, you know, these companies saw that through trial and error. So almost all the commercial cocoa choir that you find is already good to go. Um, you know, and then, you know, you have your orchid bark. And what orchid bark is, it usually comes from Douglas fir or other conifer trees that don't have sap. So you don't ever really want to use pine. Pine uh, in itself, the oils that come from pine, because of its acidity and it's how aromatic it is, it's actually very detrimental to to the respiratory systems because they're in enclosed environment for snakes, lizards, frogs, and it can actually kill frogs pretty mm -hmm. quickly. So you want to make sure that you never ever use pine. But the orchid bark typically comes from you know your your, Doug, your Douglas fir trees or something like that. They put it through a big machine that turns them into these little chunks that are about this big, and those are the wood chunks that you see so a, a a product that looks like orchid bark but isn't orchid bark if you look at zoom meds repti bark that is what orchid bark actually like it's kind of what it looks like but that actually isn't what it is it's a synthetic from my understanding like a, it's like a synthetic type of product but then if you look at orchidia 
which is like the orchid brand orchid bark that they use for the commercial mixes that's the type of orchid bark that you want to use uh and we and then it comes in different sizes so same thing with charcoal so that can also be a challenge because the bigger the piece the more space it takes up in your mix and sometimes the bigger the piece it can actually do more damage to your aeration than help so we want to make sure that the pieces that we get like the size i usually use size p2 p2 that's for charcoal if i when i use orchid bark i don't use a lot of it um you know those are what you know the sizes that you want to use in general rule of thumb guys when you are shopping or looking for ingredients so when you pick up a bag of substrate that's for sale at the store okay or if you are looking online and you want to know you know what should i be looking for in this substrate is it going to function all the parameters and all the things that i talked about before if 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 the soil if it has like just massive loan pieces in it that are bigger than a half dollar and it's the only aerating agent that you can typically see in there um you might want to stay away now when i say aerating agent what that means is those products or ingredients are in there for one reason and that is to help with the one parameter of aerating your soil from the top to the bottom to help prevent anaerobic bacterial growth and that's why abg is so effective because if you look at the ingredient list of ABG, the only dirt component, which is actually only 25, depending on what recipe you follow of the mix of cocoa choir, the other 75% of the mix is just pieces that are, you know, this big, that are just mixed together. So instead of having a dirt mixture, because it isn't dirt, it is a, is more of a granular, um coarse uh mill mixture that you've created and that's what abg is and that again that's why it's so successful another reason why we like to use those size so the p2s okay like i talked about for the size is those products break down okay you're you, you know they will eventually compact okay just like any other soil will and eventually over time you will lose your your quantity okay so if you put two big bags of let's say abg into a 20 high okay with your drainage layer that's gonna let's say you used one and a half inches of drainage layer one and a half inches of abg that's about two four quart bags that's eight quarts of abg within a year that eight quarts is going to turn into about i'd say about six um, depending on how high of a humidity that you're using, uh, as well as the type of animals and plants that you are using as well. Because, like I said before, the ability of aeration and to reinforce your, your symbiotic, you know, fungal and bacterial relationships are all integral to how your substrate performs. Um, another thing that you really want to look at is when the substrate is wet, how dusty it is. Because there are some components of your substrate, uh, depending on what you're using, when you're looking up at the bag and when it's wet and you still sift it around after the soil or components are wet and it's still dusty. A really good example of this is perlite. Or if, you, if you're not familiar with what perlite is, the grow stone. The grow stone looks like white pumice rock that there were many people using it as a drainage layer for many years, okay? But you could literally get that stuff wet, have all the sediment float to the top, put more water in it and shake it up and it would still dust. So when you do, when you use things like that, you really want to make sure that, you know, the, the SDS sheet tells you a lot. Because, you know, with me owning the business, I have to look at that stuff. But just in general, remember, you're putting those ingredients into a closed ecosystem, into a closed tank. So that stuff, it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays in. And it's no different than when you bring things from outside. I'm not telling you you can't bring things from inside or outside. Like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. But what I will say is if you're going to bring in leaf litter from outside, which is okay. You know, and you don't bake it or you don't boil it. So we always recommend to boil the leaf litter, even though we get it from good places, but you still should do it. 
It will literally take one contaminated leaf with something nasty on it to get into your tank to the point when it could poison or cause an issue with everything else. Hmm. And that comes down and you can use that as a metaphor or analogy or whatever, you know, to the efficacy of your substrate with how dusty it is. So a good example is like with my desert substrate for the Terra Sahara. You know, we have to keep it moist in the middle and bottom layers and the top layer is extremely hydroscopic, which means it's resistant to water, which means when you go to water your plants, like the water bounces off the top of the substrate, mm -hmm. which is essentially how it should be for a desert environment while it stays in the middle and bottom. But if you let that substrate completely dry out and not use it the way that that soil was designed to use, it, it can be extremely dusty. And when you're in an enclosed environment like that, like that's not something you want because it's like no different than you walking outside and you're in a big open area and the wind is gusting at you and there's a bunch of sand and grit and a whole bunch of other stuff going up your nose into your mouth and that's uncomfortable. So it's no different than your animal living in the enclosed space that they would be kind of exposed to, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh so with uh, ABG, that was made decades ago. Yes. And so uh, whenever something's made decades ago, people say, hey, I can make this better. And usually uh, people either try to make it uh, better quality, better performing, yes. or they mm -hmm. try to make it cheaper. Uh, so uh, usually, <laughs> usually the latter there, but yeah, dude, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So without knowing what's out there, could you, uh, I, I don't know exactly what's out there. Could you give us a, a little overview of where the market is right now and what has been done to increase quality and what should we watch out for with the people that have tried to decrease cost? Yeah, so that's that's a really good uh, it's a really good question. So when like so, if you are building, a, let let's focus on like tropical here, since we're main we're going to be talking about terrestrial chameleons yep. that utilize yep. bioactive habitat. So, you know, so when we are dealing and, and when, when we're looking at these animals, we want to make sure that a that these tiny chameleons can actually move the substrate. So, remember when I was talking about people using bigger than p2 ingredients yeah, that are yeah. like this big when you are dealing with a small chameleon this big they are not capable of moving those large ingredients so if you have girls that need to burrow down a couple inches to lay their eggs they may not be able to actually physically move the soil if the majority of the ingredients are the wrong size so a good example is Etsy. Etsy is an amazing marketplace, guys. You can find a lot of people that have made their own substrates that sell it, you know, for fun as a side hustle. And you find people like me, you know, and, you know, something I saw that six months ago, somebody was selling a ABG like it's either you do ABG or you don't use the name. Hmm. OK, yeah. but what you find a lot is ABG like product. Okay. okay so if it isn't specifically following the abg mix which again guys it's tree fern fiber charcoal cocoa choir new zealand spag dust and orchid bark if they are not following those five things and there's other things in there that they say mixed it up you want to look at the at the at the size of the actual and the actual ingredients that they're using nothing bigger than a quarter Okay, no pieces bigger than a quarter. Number two, you want to make sure that there is a a discernible d note that you can see between substrate and aeration material. So how I mentioned earlier, when you're looking at a bag, okay, and they say ABG like mix. When I was looking at this bag of product. It, it, it was in a gallon bag and it was filled up all the way with a 50 50 mixture of peat moss and coconut fiber that in itself would not work for anything <laughs> except maybe growing pothos yeah. but for their soil aerator what they used was p2 sized orchid bark but it was very evident that they could not get charcoal so what they did was they went to home depot 
and they bought cowboy lump charcoal, which is what you use for your grill. And then they take it and they hit it with a hammer and break it up into chunks. And then you get pieces of charcoal that are this big, this big, this big, this big, size my pinky nail. A very inconsistent size throughout the whole thing. When you have inconsistent ingredients or inconsistent ingredient sizes that you can physically see than the product itself. That is typically a red flag. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, that should, that, that's, that's me. For also, what, what, I, what I also look at is when you pick up the bag and, you know, and you're squishing it and feeling it and if there's moisture in there, and let's say it's a gallon bag and you squeeze it, and your fingers indent the bag. And when your fingers indent the bag, it doesn't leave any internal residue or like internal imprint. So when you let go, the bag just kind of goes back to doing how it was originally positioned. That is a really good hands-on way. So without me actually picking up the dirt, that's a way that I can tell if this is even going to be capable of retaining not necessarily retaining tunnels because that's not what a, it's not what ABG or ABG mix is for, but whether if it's going to get waterclogged. So when, when I say waterclogged is if I take it and I squeeze it and it doesn't, you know, and, and it, it, it conforms a little bit, that tell me that tells me that the soil itself is easily manipulated and when they go to burrow that it's gonna stay that. But what that also tells me that's gonna drain effectively well. Whereas if I go and I squeeze it and it doesn't, it just doesn't do anything and I'm like squeezing it and messing with it or and if the bag pops up like this to create a bubble and you're seeing a bunch of dust pick up within, within the bag itself and it's just mainly dust and you're not seeing ingredients, that's typically another big red flag. Okay. The other red flag to me is when the ingredients are 80 per, uh, 60% cocoa choir or more. So like I said earlier, coconut choir or coconut fiber, okay, which is, again, you can find that really easily, guys. It's $2 for a brick this big. You put it into a bucket of hot water. It expands to four times its size, and you get a whole bunch of, of cocoa, cocoa choir. You pick it up, squeeze it so it's not dripping, put it in your tank. But it's super, super, super absorptive. So when you when that takes up more than sixty percent of your substrate lit or your substrate ingredients, literally the other forty percent can be aerators. And I'm telling you, it still isn't enough in an enclosed environment when your humidity ratio is consistently above seventy. It will set you up to fail, uh, and it will also could potentially hurt your animals. So. You know, a good example are, you know, sedentary amphibians, such as tomato frogs, Pac-Man frogs. Very, very common to keep here in our hobby. They're amazing, amazing fossorial critters. But they're also really freaking lazy. So, so what they like to do is pee on the soil where they're sitting and they won't move. So if you're using just straight cocoa choir or you're using a mix that doesn't have a lot of other aerating or other types of components in there that urine is going to absorb right into the soil and not drain into the drainage layer whatsoever and then what that's going to happen is it's going to sit there and as it sits there it's going to mess with the ph of the soil and then when the ph of the soil gets messed up then it's going to start getting all that stagnation and nasty so what it can cause is skin infections on your frogs it can then that can lead to water imbalance uh which then leads to a bad time so and we've unfortunately seen that a lot okay. in my career i have fixed of all the setups that we've helped our clients repair from people that try to 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 offer it as a side hustle and unfortunately some of these species are so specific with what their needs are with how you need to tailor your ingredients that that wasn't really taken into consideration 
and we have these people bring these adult pac-man frogs in that have been living on a cocoa fiber mix for six months and they're not understanding why their pac-man frog is no longer shedding mm -hmm. why it can't really stand up when it's when it's all crooked and kind of neurologic and then we have to explain to them that it was the dirt so um not to go off too much on a tangent so you want to look at the consistency of the substrate okay you need to be able to see variable differences within the dirt itself meaning you shouldn't look at it and just see one ingredient Okay. okay like and and, and, if, and if you're that if you're that unsure because for me we already mix everything you know most people that sell everything like like they use machines and or they outsource it to thailand or indonesia you know for me do we hand mix it we hand inspect it and we hand bag it so you know those are all things that if you're gonna buy a finished product that you really want to look for. But if you're looking to get, you know, your common ingredients to make, you know, a good bioactive substrate, you know, my recommendation is a 40 to 60% dirt mixture. That's a mixture of either peat or spag, or sorry, peat moss, cocoa choir, rice hulls. There's a, uh, there's a whole bunch of different things, or you can even use topsoil as long as it doesn't have chicken or bat crap. Most topsoil has that in it. So if you're okay with animal byproducts, then you can try. But again, in an enclosed environment, that can be a bad time. Okay. And if you don't know what you're doing or what you're looking for, um, the like animal byproducts are important to jumpstart your processes. So like we don't use um, bat or chicken poop. We actually use insect byproducts. We use the frass off of phoenix worms and mealworms as our fertilizer agent and then we put that into a powder and then that's one of the ingredients that we use for our, you know for some of my flagship products to help jumpstart those processes because what a lot of you will find is when you put your mixture together or when you purchase a mixture that's already done a lot of the times those ingredients are inert guys so let's put it, let me put it into perspective. My Terraflora substrate, which is nothing like ABG, it functions the way ABG does, but it's a completely different product. You know, you know, I use peat moss, vermiculite, clay, uh, cocoa husk, and uh, clay, uh, 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 clay, clay aggregate, and cocoa and uh, cork bark granules. The cork bark granules I import from uh from south america and they have to be cooked and treated before they can even get off the truck so that's already has lost all of its value the sphagnum peat moss comes from canada and able to get it from canada over to united states it has to be pasteurized and treated it's lost everything in it your orchid uh sorry your uh your your, your clay aggregate you know, when that gets wet, that's going to activate and put that healthy stuff back into your soil. So that's one thing that you put into your soil that is going to help jumpstart those plants. So of three ingredients so far, that's only one thing that has a beneficial um, jumpstart. Makes sense. Um, and then you have your charcoal. Charcoal is great because it helps aerate. It helps take out nasties for a limited time mm -hmm. in your tank as if it was a fish tank and provides a, micro a, a microbial hot spot for your different types of cleanup crews such as springtails and then our horticultural vermiculite which is another aerator that's going to help with the top and the bottom okay like i talked about before but it's also going to be a little bit more absorptive so okay. as as it absorbs everything that's going to help like similar to the ABG, it's going to help make sure that water goes from point A to point B at the bottom while ensuring that we're keeping those humidity values in the way that we want them to be, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, you've come up with your own mix, a number of your own mixes, but say for the, the tropical uh, forest floor like we would be interested in. Absolutely. What have you changed in it and why so as i mentioned before 
I can't talk enough about how good ABG is. And there's a lot of other good brands out there that have their own version of non-ABG for the same type of tropical application. Okay. Any herb, you know, I can, I can keep going. Um, but what I changed was I absolutely hated the clunkiness of it. Because in, when I say clunkiness, it didn't look like soil to me. When I looked at my tank, it didn't look like soil. It looked like a bunch of balls of stuff. And when I mixed in my soil and mixed, or sorry, when I mixed in my leaf litter, mixed in a little bit, a little bit extra spag moss. We're talking ABG. Mm -hmm. It just, to me, it didn't, I got to be honest, it didn't have the aesthetics. And then I watched my dumpy tree frog uh, eat a piece of uh, uh, two pieces of orchid bark just for fun. And then I, I immediately was like, well, I'm done with this. Okay. Um, and then that's when I decided to, you know, instead of using some of the chunkier ingredients, which again, guys, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a great thing to use. You just, you want to know with your purposes, what's going to work best for you and your husbandry style. But what I did was I found ingredients that function similarly and that function the way I need them to for the biome I'm trying to replicate while being more visibly pleasing for me without the risk of my animals eating the ingredients, which is, you know, why with me, you know, if you look at my mixes, it's almost all completely dirt based. Like I, that's why I tell people I'm a dirt based company because that's, that's what we do. But if, if that's not, if that isn't what you want, that's okay. You know, there's a lot of other additives that you can use. So another great one, guys, is cypress mulch. So let's say you're trying to go with a more subtropical, you know, an, an animal that lives in the under canopy, like, uh, you know, for example, um, a, a carpet chameleon. Okay, they, like, they live on the forest floor under canopy. You know, ABG is a really good option for them. But uh, I have your brain here. When, you know, when, when my, the carpets I got from Frank Payne many years ago, when they bred for me and they laid their eggs, my girl burrowed down about three inches. And that's the furthest that she went down into the substrate. Is that pretty typical, Bill? Or do you notice that they, that they like to go a little bit deeper? Well, we, we messed that up for chameleons. Uh, when they're digging, they're looking for a, a dense uh, layer to lay against. So they end up digging okay. as far down as it takes to find a, a solid area to lay against. Understood. And that's why it's been a problem with the community because we see them digging to the bottom of a 12 inch barrel and say, oh, okay, wow, they want to go way far deep. So let's give them 18 inches. And, and the thing is, we've been messing up <laughs> our observations uh, and our interpretation of the situation uh, with carpet chameleons you can give them three inches four inches and that's more than enough for them to lay chameleons like to lay you'll notice like in the wild you see pictures of them their head is right above the surface of makes sense so that's about as far okay. as they want to go and if we okay. give them the proper conditions that's as far as they will go yes yep and you just said it perfectly you give them the proper conditions so Again, when we recreate our husbandry parameters, most of the time, guys, it starts with your soil, depending on what type of you're getting at. But I don't don't want to digress. So um, what I was talking about was, let's say we want to create like our own mix that is going to be really good at maintaining humidity, but putting humidity spikes throughout the day. Okay, so that's something like animals that like high humidity, but not all the time. Goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. Um, at least that's how I kept I kept my carpets carpets. They had a typical humidity and then a couple times a day I'd have it really really spike up and then go back down. Uh, but what I did to help with that was I had my flora recipe, you know, like I told you guys a little bit ago. But instead of using the instead of using the uh, like the, the vermiculite because I didn't want it constantly shutting out. But I also wanted to make sure that I provided, as you said perfectly, almost like a better amount of surface area in the substrate so that way it'll retain the burrow, but at the same time give them something to put the eggs on. Cypress mulch is another very, very, very good substrate additive. I use cypress mulch, I use cypress in 75% of my mixes. It okay. is hands down one of the best 
things that you can use. Uh, you just so when you guys are looking for Cypress, you want to make sure that you're not getting the Cypress blend. The Cypress blend has a mixture of conifers, so it's Cypress and pine mixed together. We both know that pine is no bueno. So you don't ever want to use that. You want to make sure it's 100% cypress. You also want to make sure that the pieces on it aren't huge. Because sometimes you rip open that bag and you'll find pieces half the size of my arm that are very, mm -hmm. very, very sharp. So, you know, when used in conjunction with your soil, like I said a couple minutes ago, the soil ingredients that you're using size matters okay you don't want to be too big you don't want to be too small think about it this way if abg how i talked about how the ingredients are clunkier and x y and z like that's that's because that's how it's designed to function instead of using p2 size what if they went to the smallest size possible and when i say smallest size possible it's pretty much a powder form you put all of those ingredients together in a powder form, do you think that it would be as effective? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't, not if we want aeration. Exactly. Exactly. So that is why when you are looking at commercial or when you're looking to create your own or when you're looking to buy ingredients online, that you are able to maintain a consistency in size that is going to work for your application in your tank. We've got, uh, we can see, go on online, we can find uh, recipes uh, for this sure all over can. the place. What kind of things do we have to watch out for if we want to try to make something of our own? Um, okay. One everybody's an expert on the internet it's like when you go and your dog is sick and you do research online and then you go to the vet, the veterinarian and you tell them what's wrong with with your dog yep and yep. then the veterinarians like just be quiet because you have no <laughs> idea what the hell you're talking about uh -huh. it, 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 no I, I i do exaggerate there is some really good helpful articles out there like i actually have a diy article for like tropical and desert substrates that Mariah helped me write on my blog about different ingredients you can use, where you can find them and the ratios. Um, so that way you're set up for a success. So when you are looking at, you know, different ingredients, you want to look at product efficacy and proof of concept. So if somebody is posting on Reddit, you know, that I like to use a top soil, so this is, this is my favorite thing is people love to use scots topsoil and play sand mixed together as like your as like your arid setup here's the thing topsoil is a is, is a good product but i want you to say topsoil out loud topsoil 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 is on the very very top it goes topsoil it goes biodegradables topsoil actual dirt what happens to the top two layers over time very quickly in a bioactive habitat? They break down. They Good lose thing. their efficacy. They need replaced. Guess what topsoil is going to do? I don't know. <laughs> topsoil is going to be have, have a very similar tra tra trajectory if you're not filling it in with other ingredients to help combat that breakdown. So... When you get Scott's topsoil, which is what almost everybody's going to recommend, well, not everybody, but a lot of you'll mm -hmm. find on Reddit as a major component. Mm -hmm. Topsoil already has a lot of times sand, granite, and top dirt in it, which can be a mixture of a whole bunch of different things. But when you just mix sand with that, you're literally just creating a sandy, a sandy topsoil mixture that is so effective at aerating that you're gonna watch it go this deep, this deep, this deep, to this deep, and probably I don't know six months. Mm -hmm. So, and able to combat that, what you need to do is add in other types of agents to a help prevent the massive absorption of water from point a to point b so fast so that way you get moisture in the middle and bottom layers and dry on the top 
okay so it's kind of the same with you know with snakes so you and i both know when you're keeping snakes the top of the substrate can't be wet all the time because they'll get infections on their scales because it's always wet it's like if we were always wearing wet clothes we would get mold on our clothes and then that could make us sick it isn't any different than those guys so when you're looking at recipe when you're looking at ingredients online things that are just topsoil and one other ingredient they will work for six months but after okay. that you will either need to do another top off of more topsoil which is going to perpetuate the long-term issue that you're dealing with or you got to start putting in other additives such as you know a little bit of cocoa choir a little bit of charcoal x y and z and then you also need to make sure that the topsoil or whatever brand of bag that they're using isn't cut with bat or chicken poop because 95 percent of the topsoils and other things that you find are cut with are they're literally grown in it like they compost yeah. it to they compost it together and then it goes through it goes up a it goes up a conveyor down into a giant funnel put in the bag machine seals the bag put it back the truck yeah i noticed that as an ingredient in a lot of the soils it is yeah. it is and it is a good ingredient i've actually been testing so not digress a 75% of what I use comes from quarries, actually, because that's what I know and that's what I trust. When it comes to, you know, actual topsoil, if I personally would use topsoil in my mixes, which I, again, I've experimented with, it was never more than 25% of the actual dirt composition section of the soil. That was not only for my preference, but because of, of efficacy, because when you are dealing with an animal that may need humidity it's a pain in the butt to have topsoil give you consistent humidity readings because it's mainly sand granite it's gonna it's gonna dry out and aerate so effectively which if that's what you're trying to go with that's great but then you also have to look at with your ingredient list if you are familiar with the ingredients how dusty is it so like we talked about with the with the perlite you know, I, I've seen a lot of people use perlite in their bioactive mixes, you know, and I've seen perlite be more than 20% of the actual mix. What they don't tell you is that they likely don't rinse off that perlite a couple times before they mix it in all together. So all of those silica particles, all of those nasty, nasty, dusty particles are mixed up in your soil. Okay. So what do you think's going to happen or I shouldn't say what do you think so what happens is when you add in add in your moisture or your biodegradables in with that all of that stuff is being mixed into your soil and then you're putting your animal to live on it. So understanding where your ingredients come from mm -hmm. is another big factor in your decision making when putting together your substrate. Um, you know, but again, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of ingredient lists out there. And when you see it, see if anybody else has had long-term success with it. Now, when I, I'm talking long-term success, success, I'm talking longer than a year, because if you set up a bioactive habitat and you invest the money in the cleanup crew, you invest the time into maintaining it the way, and you have to you know, top off more than 50% of your substrate, or you have to redo your substrate in a year, then you didn't do it right. Mm. And then at that point, you're better off doing a naturalistic habitat because if you have to change out your substrate then in a year, it's very likely that, that your microbiological and fungal processes weren't really even happening that effectively in the first place, which means your soil health may have been questionable. And then when your animal is living you know on substrate that may have questionable ph or questionable ammonia levels or questionable whatever it could open up the door for headaches mm -hmm. and none of us want to deal with headaches no no i don't <laughs> well uh say we get a good uh good uh substrate mix uh yep another critical component of it all is the leaf litter and the things we put on top of the mix. Yes, it is. How do we choose what to put on top? And if we're going to collect leaves of our own, how do we know which yeah. leaves to collect? That is a great question. So when you look at the leaves, 
of the leaves, the branches, you need to look at where they come from. It's no different than your substrate ingredients. You need to look at where these leaves, where this bark came from. If, for example, you want, you found some awesome looking bark slabs into, you're walking outside and you see bark slabs and floor, oh, these would be great for my isopod cultures. What, what tree is it from? Better not be from a freaking pine tree type of thing. So, so when you are looking at what is, if you want to go outside, you want to make sure that the leaves that the tree are coming from, that that tree is safe for your animals. You don't want to use a tree that has a lot of sap. Okay. You don't want to use a tree that, you know, that has a byproduct, you know, that if you ate it can make you sick. Okay. So you know i like to recommend any oak species so there is hundreds of oak species in the united states you know there's bam there's uh, there's bamboo leaves there's magnolia uh you know there's a whole bunch of different types of leaves that you can use but at the end of the day you want to make sure it's just not from a source that is toxic to your animals what you also want to look at is where they come from on the ground so it's likely not a good idea to go get your leaf litter from your front yard. If you spray your yard with Roundup, um, guess what? There's going to be byproducts, by Roundup byproduct on those leaves. And it only takes one bad leaf to get that crap in your tank. And when it's in your tank, it's in there for good. And you ain't getting it out. So when you, what you can also use for top layer, we talked about leaf litter. I love, I mix everything together. So when I use leaf litter, I don't just dump it on the top. I take it and I thoroughly mix it. And what I will also use is cork bark chunks. So how I told you how my terraflora has the virgin cork bark granules in it that are the size of my pinky nail. Mm -hmm. So what I'll take is I'll take the larger pieces of cork flats that I have, they're about this big. And I'll put about a dozen pieces in the substrate, depending on how much I'm using. And I'll mix that thoroughly throughout the substrate. And then you can also use things like palm leaves, like the palm fronds you get on Palm Sunday. Those are very, very good because it's very fibrous. So when you are looking at bark and when you're looking at leaves, if you look at a magnolia, you can feel it's thick. You can feel that it has a very dense, fibrous nature the more fibrinous the material the better it is bamboo is another extreme like actual bamboo is an extremely beneficial substrate additive because essentially what happens is because it's so fibrinous it absorbs water and as it absorbs water the fibers expand when those fibers expand it creates a surface area that is that is significantly more impactful. Kind of like when you're using a fish tank filter and you need to use bio balls to trap your beneficial bacteria because of all the surface area. It's no different in your soil. What's gonna happen is with how like this it's gonna be, okay? Your mycorrhizae, your archaea bacteria, and your cleanup crew are gonna get right on it. And because you have an extended surface area in your soil, it's gonna become a very positive microbial hotspot to help your tank cycle. Okay, that makes sense. So I'll typically mix all that together. Now, if I, it like, you know, and I've done this too, you know, I, I've actually, um, I'm, I am planning a Texas biome right now um, exhibit for my showroom. That is nothing but uh, Texas wood, Texas animals and Texas plants. Uh, and what I'm doing with that is when I bring these products in from outside, uh, like I recommend to all of my clients and what we have on the instructions on the leaf litter is I will take my bit, my gown, my thing of leaves. Okay. Whatever you decide to get and I'll boil some water and then I will usually boil those leaves for about 10 minutes. And that is just to make sure that we're not getting any, anything. It guys, it, it like you can get spider eggs, you can get ant eggs, you can get ants. You know, there is absolutely no way when you are buying leaf litter from anybody, don't let anybody ever tell you that their leaves are guaranteed clean unless yeah. they can prove to you that they baked it or boiled it. 
Okay. Because other than that, there is no other way to do it. Um, and then you can put those leaves on top or mix them in, however you want to do it. And then that same thing with bark and palm fronds outside. I don't like putting wood in the oven. I don't like to do it. It makes me uncomfortable and my wife really, really hates it. <laughs> um, and I am sure other people can sympathize, but if you're a brave one and you have a piece of wood that doesn't have any leaves or any small combustible sticks, you can put it in your oven at 250 degrees for about 25 minutes after the oven's preheated. That should and can take care of almost everything that could be considered a hitchhiker for your environment okay if that makes sense yeah now say we do go out and we have some leaves uh how do we tell whether there's anything we should be concerned about like we have google and so i can find it's out true. the uh the species of the, the tree but what am i looking at to tell me if it's dangerous or not if it's sticky so if, if, if you pick up the leaves and it has like sticky sap on it okay n uh not not today back away disco lady you do not want those things um another thing to look at is if you come across a pile of leaves and if you notice like white what looks like mold on it but it's like flat and spreading across the leaf that's likely mycorrhizae you have nothing to worry about but if you pick up a leaf and it's covered in black mold or has black mold on it, you don't ever want to use it. Okay. Because what you don't want to do is bring those mold spores into your tank. Um, you know, boiling might help that. But um, and then as well as eggs. So a lot of times when you're looking at, you know, leaves, spider eggs, depending on the species of spider, it'll look like a little white fuzzy cotton ball. That can be the size of my pinky nail, or it can be even a sixteenth of this size. And they'll literally attach them right underneath. Things like that you can also look for. Another good uh, another good thing to look for are is evidence of leaf eating worms. Um, so, for example, um, we would have these worms while I was growing up in Pennsylvania that would get at our fruit trees, at our apple trees, and they would first go to the leaves and then they would leave little holes about a quarter of an inch thick or wide excuse me and there'll be a couple holes on the leaf just random holes mm -hmm. and then they would get to the apple and then they would put that hole through the apple from point a all the way to point b <laughs> and then they would then go to one apple and then the next apple and the next apple so but the thing is you would never ever see these critters so there would be an entry level into the apple, but you don't see an exit hole. And then my parents would take the apple and cut it in half and try to see what is doing this to our apple tree. And then there'd be nothing in there. Hmm. Chances are it's in there. We just didn't see it and we didn't know what, what, what we were looking for. So I feel like that is another okay. principle that can be you know applied and followed when you're looking at things like that because it's very easy to bring in hitchhikers especially ants because mm. ants are extremely good at hiding or burrowing like court like wood slabs they're really especially texas red ants man they can literally chew through chew through wood so it only takes one to two ants to cause okay. a problem all right so we've set up our system and now what do we do to maintain a healthy substrate good question so one thing with your substrate you know you are going to have different levels of elements in your in your substrate when you start as it progresses throughout its life now when we're talking about elements we're talking about phosphorus calcium magnesium you know i can i can keep going now to normal people those are those don't matter okay but when we have our substrate and our biodegradables and we if we decided to use an inoculant such you know to put in your mycorrhizae it's established it's going so what you're so as let's say we're eight months in and you notice that your springtail and isopod populations are booming 
and you're going to need to maintain and make sure that your soil composition doesn't lose its productivity. So throughout the life of your enclosure, you will need to add in fresh biodegradables. Okay. And as your soil progresses, there may need to be a top off depending on the type of soil that you're using. Now, when I say top off, you know, it might, it might just be a quart. It might just be two handfuls. It's different for everybody. Okay. And that also goes for biodegradable usage. When I say biodegradable usage, I'm talking about, uh, you know, your leaf litter, or your stuff you mix into your soil. How quickly are your, are your biological processes and your cleanup crew breaking them down? That is typically indicative of your environment. If you have a very, very, very high humidity environment, well, your stuff's going to break down a lot faster. Whereas okay. if you have a desert biome or if you are more aggressive with your seeding in your desert biome and use a more aggressive species of, our, of isopod, well, then that more aggressive species of isopod is going to consume more biodegradable. So you'll need to you know, maintain that. So that's the first thing we always tell people is you will need to make sure that your soil level is staying at the level that you want it to stay, as well as making sure you add in your fresh biodegradables. Now, now if you do have a very extensive cleanup crew population within your tank, and it depending on this also depends on the size of the tank. As your cleanup crew take, you know, some things they take don't get replenished. All, you know, a lot of us know that isopods need a very good source of calcium, you know, especially our more predatory types like your dairy cows that will eat a whole fish. Okay. So it's, you know, what some people like to do is supplement their bugs with a calcium bone. Okay. And they'll put a calcium, they'll take the calcium bone and crush it up and then they'll sprinkle on top of their substrate. And that, that is a great thing to do. Uh, and that can help replenish the lost calcium levels. So what I'm getting at is if you had your soil, say you had your soil for a year, okay, and you've been replacing the biodegradables, you have did a little bit of a top off and you're, you're seeing your mycorrhizae, you're seeing mushrooms come up, which is great, and your plants are doing good and your animals are thriving, but you're noticing a cutback on your plants. Now, as your tank cycles and you get used to maintaining the parameters of your enclosure, you'll start to kind of understand how your tank trends. How quickly does your different plants grow? Um, how often do I need to do trimmings? Things like that. One thing you'll notice that as your substrate progresses in its life, those cleanup crews do eventually deplete, you know, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus. Those are all the things your plant roots really need to grow big and strong and to keep growing. Okay. Um, so when you have a tank that is so seeded, and if we're not supplementing with calcium, you know, it might be recommended to get such as a supplement that is a, a year uh, for tanks that are a year or older that has a hearty mixture of magnesium and phosphorus and calcium and other things in there like that and just sprinkle it on the top, you know, oh. There are some, there are some schools of thought thinking that it may not be necessary, but for me, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years or longer than that, but I've had tanks going for longer than 10 years. And that has been my formula. You know, every single year we do a little bit of a top off. I usually add in about, you know, depending on the biome between two and six quarts of substrate. We'll add in more biodegradables and then I'll usually sprinkle in a little bit of calcium magnesium, phosphorus, all that good stuff, and kind of mix it in through the top very gentle. So that way I don't, don't, hurt, don't displace too much of my cleanup crew and my processes and X, Y, and Z. Um, and then what I get from that is consistency throughout the life of the enclosure. Whereas, you know, when you are creating your own soil, like I told you guys before, the majority of your ingredients are going to be inert, you know, because we are proactively taking steps not to have animal byproduct in the soil. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to have animal byproduct in the soil, we would just go to store and buy miracle Grow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's why we, it's why we don't do that or really advocate that. 
So, you know, uh, as far as like maintaining it and with me, that's what I do. And then the most important thing is not oversaturating your soil. Dry on the top, moist in the middle and bottom layers, depending on the biome, unless it's an extremely high humidity biome. And then if it's wet, if it's moist on the top, middle and bottom, make darn sure that it is aerating and draining from point A to point B and that your drainage layer that the water that the drainage layer is collecting is never superseding into the layer of substrate that the drainage layer is protecting. Okay. All right. Uh, I believe you've given us a whole lot to talk about and think about <laughs> and uh, and look more into. Uh, so I think this is a, a, a very good, good place to uh, let us mull on this. Uh, is there awesome. anything else that I didn't think to ask that you think we should know about? There something? is. There's there's one more thing that I really wanted to hit home. Okay. So how a substrate functions, it is different everywhere. The way that my commercial substrates, I'm gonna, so the way that my commercial substrate, one of them functions up in Pennsylvania with the maintenance required is different than here in Texas. Hmm. So where you live, plays a role with how your substrate functions. Why is that? So when I'm, I, 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 I like to think of it this way. With me living in Houston, we don't really have, we have, we kind of, we have a season where it's unbearably hot and humid. Then we have a season where it's just hot and humid. And when we walk outside, it's like there's a humidity index of 90 to 100% what it feels like, what it is every single day. So even in the winter time, it's humid. And what I found here is that my terrariums down here in Houston, I have a lot easier time maintaining my humidity levels and my soil and within the tank itself because of just how it is here. Mm -hmm. But when I lived in Pennsylvania, when I was breeding dart frog, when winter time came, when November came, I would have to up my mist king 20 seconds more a day. I would have to hand mist about 30 to 45 seconds longer a day for my quarantine enclosures when I was using sphagnum moss my sphagnum moss with my coconut fiber and my orchid bark mixture that I would keep them on for about a week until I change it out unless they were being dewormed I use paper towels mm -hmm. but you couldn't use paper towels in the winter time with amphibians because you wet it and it's dry in four hours so what, I, what I'm getting at is the dry, the dryness of that area up there affected my soil mm -hmm. composition and in-tank functionality. So depending on where you are, if you are building your own substrate, which is great, do your research, look, pay attention to what's outside and around you with what your current maintenance looks like on your tanks when it comes to misting. So that way you get your three parameters taken care of. And then from there, you'll be able to have a little bit better of an understanding of what things you might wanna add versus what you think you may not need. Um, because again, I had to use a lot more, you know, humidity additives in Pennsylvania than I have to use down here just in general and that's for everything bill i'm talking like for my dark frogs for my snakes um and even for my desert animals um up in up in pa i'd have to use a whole six quart bag of sphagnum moss for uh for, for 12 quarts of sahara down here i have to use a third of a six quart bag for 12 quarts to give me the same desired functionality in a very dry portion of the year okay if that makes sense okay yeah it does it does uh, all right i yeah. want to say thank you very much for coming on we're going to uh, absorb all of this uh, in our uh, our quest for developing more and more bioactive skills in the chameleon community i'm very excited <laughs> for this yeah uh so okay then I'll let you go with your afternoon. Thank you very much. And we'll okay. see you later. No problem, Bill. Thanks again for the opportunity. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. <laughs>